So good morning students and uh, today we continue with uh, lecture 7 and uh, that will be followed by lecture 8 and this is for week 4. And what we will be covering is public production of goods and services and public choice. The uh, readings for this uh, lecture are Stiglitz and Rosengard chapters 8 to 9. So now what we will discuss is the basic economics of the natural monopoly, uh, regulation, taxation, subsidies in greater detail. Uh, what happens if there is no government intervention? What happens if government fails to intervene and also sources of inefficiency in the public sector? And we will also cover the problem of preference revelation. So let's begin with a background. Uh, so um, and that background deals with this concept of privatization versus nationalization. So in the past, most governments took charge of industry directly. So for example, what governments would do is they would provide telephone services or electricity. In some countries, countries continue to do this. So for example, specifically governments continue to do this. Specifically in South Africa, the Electricity utility is called ESCOM and is wholly owned by government. But that was the idea, some, that some public services should be provided solely by government. What has happened is that these state-owned enterprises or these utilities or these services provided by government, these companies owned by government that would provide service to the public, have been shown to be quite inefficient or have not functioned really well. So what has happened is that many of them have been privatized. In other words, they have been placed in private hands. So that is where we get this concept of privatization. And this has happened in Western Europe as well as transitional economies in Eastern Europe and also in Asia. And this has especially been the case uh, for utilities such as gas, electricity and telecommunications and for railroads and airlines. And the argument is, well, if we privatize something, then if it doesn't do well, it's no longer really our problem. So we get to save money. So that is an argument in favor of privatization. So government doesn't have to deal with problems associated with an enterprise that it owns. Instead, it is now the owner's problem once it's been privatized. However, there has been a resurgence of this idea that it is government that can best provide certain services. And this has been particularly observed in Latin America. Um, and the argument has been that governments are best able to achieve social objectives by exerting direct control over key economic sectors. And this has resulted in nationalization of a large number of industries. And an example of where this has happened is Venezuela. Other examples are post-2008 in the U United States, where government took over major mortgage and insurance companies, and also in the United Kingdom when government took over major banks. However, there is still a strong school of thought, not still, but there has always been a strong school of thought that believes that government is inefficient. It is an inefficient producer and we should not be nationalizing um, companies as, and uh, entities. Instead, these should remain in private hands. So why does the public production of uh, private goods enter the equation? And what does it have to do with the government intervention? Well, essentially what can happen is that government will take over an enterprise. And then what we have is we have a monopoly where that enterprise, which we will call now a state owned enterprise, provides a specific good that would otherwise be provided by the private sector. So what we have is we have the public production of private goods. So what can lead to the public production of private goods? Well, essentially a market failure. Um, and this happens when markets may not be competitive. And this is what provides an explanation for the government production, production of telecommunications, water and electricity in a given country. Now, why might markets not be competitive in certain times? Well, the reason why is that um, there is something called the existence of uh, returns to scale, increasing returns to scale, to be specific. In other words, the more of a good that is produced, the less is the average cost of producing that good. 
In order for this sort of thing to happen, though, what we need is that there is a limited number of firms. Specifically, we can't have a perfectly competitive market. So that is what is required by economic efficiency so that we can access increasing returns to scale. Now, the absolute extreme of that is something called a natural monopoly. So that is a monopoly for which the status of a monopoly is prescribed by law. And therefore, the result is that there is only a single firm that operates in the market. An example is water or the provision of water. The costs of delivering water are quite high. You have to construct the infrastructure, which is obviously very expensive. So you have to install pipes. And as you can imagine, if there are two companies that are providing this infrastructure, not only is there a cost that is associated to each company, but also it is inefficient. So, for example, if our two companies are providing water, you need to have two sets of pipes instead of setting one, instead of having one set of pipes. So, for example, one set of pipes would deliver to one home and the next set of pipes or the next network would deliver to the neighbor's home. It doesn't really make sense to do this. In other words, it might make sense to have a single firm operating in a market. So now let's talk about the basic economics of a natural monopoly. So one of the proposition was on the previous slide was that it makes sense to have few or in fact one firm if it is possible to access uh, increasing returns to scale. In other words, if the quantity of output is associated with falling costs as the quantity of output is increased. And this is what we see here. As output increases, average costs decline. Now, where is it that we could produce? So efficiency requires the price is equal to the marginal cost. So the price equaling the marginal cost would be at this point. And this would correspond to a quantity of Q subscript zero. Here's where we are at. There is, however, one problem. The average cost curve is above the price. Right. Remember, we see the price here. If this is the case, such a firm would suffer loss. Essentially, it is charging less for each unit, additional unit of output produced than it costs it to produce that output on average. Because such a firm is making a loss, one solution is to offer a subsidy. However, the problem with a subsidy is that subsidies cost less is money that is coming from somewhere else. So the question with a subsidy arises is where is this money coming from? Where are revenues you raised in order to pay for a subsidy? So um, with the subsidy, there is the assumption that there are no costs associated with raising this revenue. That is in a theoretical sense. However, there are costs associated with raising revenue and specifically the monies that are then used for a subsidy. So one solution for a monopoly situation is to insist that monopolies operate at a specific price point. And that price point is where the price is equal to the average cost. So this is the point that we are at. And the quantity we will be producing would correspond to Q subscript one. So in other words, we are producing below the efficient quantity. And this is called a zero profit point. Okay, average total, uh, average costs are equal to the price level. So hence, there is no profit that is being made by a monopoly. And the reasons why governments try to do this is to make sure that these firms essentially pay for themselves. Otherwise, if we are producing at this point, where I'm now putting the cross, what would happen is the monopoly would be making a loss. If this was the case, government would have to subsidize it. So this is why the insistence at operating at a point where the average cost is equal to the price. And yes, this does result in a lower quantity being produced. Now, the question is, is this strictly a situation of a single firm operating in a market, a monopoly? Well, the answer is not so clear. If it is easy to enter an industry, then essentially what happens is that we can move away from a monopoly situation. However, if it's difficult, then we remain in a monopoly situation. So yes, it remains a monopoly, 
But what we also have to consider how easy it is for other firms to enter the market. Once that entry happens, and if it's easy, then we no longer have a monopoly situation. And that brings us to our second point. Now what we have to discuss is the role of competition. So the zero profit point is the point at which natural monopolies may operate under the assumption that there is no effective competition. Now, what is it that would happen if monopolies were or single firms in a market were operating at a point that does not equal to the zero profit point? In other words, they would be charging a price that exceeds the average cost of production. The result would be that because there is a profit to be made, then other firms would enter that market in order to capture that profit, and that profit would be competed away. These firms would enter this market if it was relatively too en easy to enter such a market. In other words, if there were no barriers to entry. So for example, what is a barrier to entry? Licensing. So let's say there is one single airline in a country. Well, before others can enter the market, what has to happen is that they need to get a license and that license might not be granted. So therefore, the barriers to entry might be high. But if they are not high and a monopoly decides to operate above a zero profit point, well, the risk is that there will be other entrants. And what they will do is they will provide a service at a lower price. What this essentially means is that the presence of a single firm in industry does not imply that a firm can exercise monopoly power. In other words, it might not be able to extract profits because there is always a threat of entry, if it is easy to enter, that is. So as a result, this is why it might make sense that a monopoly continues to operate at a zero profit point. So from the previous slide, the situation we spoke about where monopoly operates at a zero uh, profit point, if it wasn't operating at a zero profit point where prices would be above the average cost, the situation that we would have is that potential entrants could enter the market and compete those profits away. Now, this can happen if there are very low entry barriers. So let's talk about what entry barriers are. So one form of an entry barrier are sunk costs. So sunk costs are costs that are not recoverable upon the exit of a firm. So for example, money that is spent on advertising, marketing and research and development projects that cannot be carried forward into another market or industry. And also these arise when you are trying to enter into a sector and to compete with an incumbent. So what we have is an asymmetry between a firm that is established in an industry and one that is not established in industry. So think about uh, competing with a water providing monopoly. What would you have to do? You would have to build a network of pipes to deliver water. Obviously the costs are absolutely massive. Now, what would happen if you had to exit the industry for some reason? You would not be able to recover those costs. Furthermore, the firm that is already operating in the sector, in other words, it is already providing water as a water utility, has already established a network. So they don't have to lay out any funds in order to build a network, whereas you have to incur some costs in order to start competing in that industry. So what sunk costs do is they act as a barrier to entry by allowing an established firm a degree of monopoly power that could not be exercised otherwise. Why? Because an incumbent firm, the firm that is already operating in industry, let's use our water utility as an example, could, for example, lower costs. If it lowers costs and you are a new entrant, you are unlikely to be able to compete with that firm or that utility that operates in that market. Why? Because you still have to incur excessive costs or large costs in order to start competing. So this is why monopolies tend to arise and why government are not or don't rely on the threat of potential competition because they are sunk costs that prevent any challenge to an existing monopoly in a given market. Now, theoretically, what should happen is a monopoly should operate at a point 
where there are zero profits. But the reality is because there's no competition and because sunk costs present a barrier, what can happen is that a monopoly can potentially exploit consumers. So if it is impossible for competitors enter a market where a monopoly operates, what a monopolist might do is increase its prices. In other words, it will no longer operate at this point, but will operate at a point that maximizes its profits. And that is a point where the marginal revenue is equal to the marginal cost. In other words, this price level, whereas the average cost remains now or is below the price. Whereas previously it was equal to the price. So what happens is that we now have a reduction in output. So output declines from Q subscript one to Q asterisk, which is this point here. So therefore the level of profit is the difference between the price and the average cost multiplied by the quantity of a good that is being produced or sold by the monopolist. Okay, recall, all this can happen because competitors cannot enter the market, because there's high sunk costs or any other host of other barriers, such as licensing, an operating license, let's say. If others were able to enter, they would enter the market because they see that profits can be made and profits would be competed away right up until the point that we arrive back at the zero profit point, which would be here. So in summary, we have a situation that if there are barriers in the form of sunk costs, and remember any other barriers, there is the danger the monopolist will take advantage of its position and charge a higher price in a situation like that. So what is it that a government can do? Well, what it can choose to do is it can take over production. So let's say the monopoly is a privately owned telecom uh, uh, telecoms uh, uh, firm and there is a concern that it is using its position as the only provider of a uh, good to charge or make monopoly profits as we would call it other in other words it's not operating at zero profit point so hence government either could seize that firm and operate at the zero profit point or alternatively, what it could do is it could regulate the firm to ensure that it does not take advantage of its monopoly position. In other words, it could force it or regulate it to operate at the zero profit point or closer to the zero profit point. Alternatively, it can also use subsidies to encourage the firm to provide services that might not be profitable privately but are viewed as socially desirable. So the two approaches in order to ensuring that a monopoly does not charge high prices is to either regulate it, and that is the approach that has been taken in the United States, or alternatively to rely on government ownership, which tends to be the approach that is taken in more left-leaning countries, okay, specifically a lot of European countries and elsewhere. So two ways to... Uh, make sure that a monopoly does not exploit its customers is either to regulate it or to other or otherwise nationalize it and this is essentially government intervention now whereas this is one way of dealing with it another way of dealing with monopolies is just simply not for government to intervene and there are arguments potentially compelling as to why government should not intervene in monopolies in other words they should be left to the private sector even if we are dealing with a natural monopoly. So Arnold Harberger, who's an American economist, estimated that the loss from monopoly pricing is relatively small. In other words, less than 3% of the value of output. Remember that the level of output that is produced by a profit maximizing monopoly is lower than that of a monopoly that does not maximize its profits. So essentially, if the loss in value of output is so low, it is a cost benefit analysis. So some economists believe that the cumulative loss in efficiency from either regulation or government production may be much greater. So it is a matter of choosing 
um, one of the lesser two evils. Do we do we, do we uh, manage uh, do we allow monopolies to function and produce output beyond, below the optimal point or do we regulate them and or or run them and therefore uh, incur costs uh, inefficiency costs that are above that suggested 3% there's also other losses just not a matter of efficiency losses not only a matter of efficiency losses also if you have a monopoly which is not competing there is no incentive to innovate so what we are essentially seeing is a stifling of innovation remember when you have firms that are competing against each other what they need to do is they need to produce at lower costs they need to sell better products and so on this entails innovation however if that is not happening what happens is that there is if there's not competition is, is not happening there is no incentive to innovate i'll give you an example of what has happened in south africa so uh, south africa had a single uh, telecoms provider of landlines uh, and for decades telcom as it's called was a natural monopoly that was bestowed monopoly status by the government in providing landlines. The result is that South Africa has some of the highest communication costs in the world as a result of this, and also some of the worst internet speeds or worst internet speeds that a lot of countries are less developed. And this is because of a lack of innovation in the sector that was promoted or specifically was stifled by telecom being a monopoly the world has however changed so today there is generally more competition than in the past so for example several firms now provide telephone and electricity services so there is competition in some sectors where there wasn't competition previously however there are still sectors where there is no competition okay, such as water utilities so therefore regulation is now focused on ensuring that there is competition when competition is viable so what emerges from the slides previously is that there are market failures a market failure that we observed in the previous slide is that suboptimal quantity is being produced due to the presence of a monopoly now what government does not only in such instances either through regulation or nationalization or simply running programs it intervenes when there is a market failure so yes, there are market failures, but also there can potentially be government failures in the programs, whether it's regulatory, whether it's in terms of running enterprise or in another area, government can also fail. So why are there government failures? What is it that drives these? Well, specifically speaking, there are four major reasons. The first is limited information. In other words, consequences arise as a result of government action and it is difficult to foresee these consequences let's use an example where there is a job help scheme or a um, grant help scheme offered to those that are disabled so yes those that are disabled receive funds but then there will be some that will also be free riders they will claim to be disabled and also receive those funds that flow from that program the reason why they are able to do that in other words why they are able to qualify for this program is not because they are disabled but because government does not have all information in other words information is limited so limited information on the part of government may preclude it from distinguishing between those who are truly disabled and those that are pretending to be disabled next government cannot control private market responses so for example in the uh, united states when medicare was instituted this results in a rapid increase in health expenditures after the adoption of the program so although the government set prices in other words this is a government intervention in the healthcare market it cannot control utilization it cannot control the behavior of doctors and also patients and it cannot control how much and what kind of services are provided so government simply does not have control over the consequences of its actions
then we have also limited control over bureaucracy. So what government does is it makes decisions and then it delegates these decisions to certain agencies. And these agencies might be responsible for both giving effect in terms of writing regulations to a specific decision and then carrying out that decision. And often what will happen is that these agencies will fail to carry out the decisions of the government correctly or to the extent that government wants to, to them to be carried out. An example today is um, the COVID-19 restrictions that are being applied throughout the United Kingdom. And as you can see, in certain cities, people are still partying and still having large gatherings and completely ignoring these restrictions. So again, what's happening here is that government does not have um, the ability to uh, control private market responses. One could view it that way. And also it cannot control fully the bureaucracy that is responsible for carrying out and enforcing these decisions. And sometimes this bureaucracy might not be effective. In other words, let's say that the police can't get crowds under control or they can't enforce that res uh, the restrictions that have been decided by a central government. Then there are also limitations that are imposed by the political process. So even if government is perfectly informed about consequences, and even if bureaucracy fully functions, the government still has to function within a political framework. So let's talk about a country where there is a constitution. Government could enforce its decisions if it had absolute power. But part of the political process is that it has to respect a constitution. So, for example, let's say that government will want to throw all those that are uh, disobeying COVID-19 restrictions in prison and deal with the crisis in that following manner. Well, that's not possible because they still would have to stand trial and that potentially would violate the Constitution. In other words, the government is not all powerful. And hence, that is a limitation that is imposed by a political process in this instance. So that is why government may also fail, because it cannot do everything. It is limited by certain rules and regulations within which it functions. And critics of government intervention and notable economist is Milton Friedman. Uh, and these critics argue that given these limitations subject to or given these reasons for government failures, what should happen is that government should not intervene in the economy because it is restrained to such an extent that it will introduce deficiencies into markets. In other words, intervention because of these limitations, because of these restrictions and these reasons will not be effective. Next, we go back to the theme of uh, the role of a firm within the economy. And what we're going to discuss is the reasons as to why government will not be effective at running certain enterprises uh, within an economy. And this has essentially been seen in numerous countries. So, for example, in South Africa, the uh, national airline is now bankrupt. It is state owned. So obviously government is not efficient for a number of reasons in running these enterprises there. So what are some of the organizational differences between private and public enterprises? First of all, public enterprises are not driven by the profit motive. They have little incentive to maximize productivity. They are often driven by political concerns that work against productivity. So, for example, public enterprises are also often used as an employment vehicle by governments. In other words, they are there to build or provide employment. Also, because in some countries public enterprises cannot go bankrupt, they don't worry about losses that they make. Why? Because these losses are funded by government revenues. In other words, if a public enterprise fails, a company that is owned by the government, that is, then what government will do is it will step in and it will recapitalize it. In other words, it will keep it afloat. Unlike a private business that if that business runs out of money, in other words, it goes bankrupt, it ceases to exist. So hence, it could be said that public enterprises face a soft budget constraint and that they operate in an environment with limited competition.
and because they operate in an environment of limited competition, they do not really have to worry about innovation or keeping costs down for that matter. Next, what we also have in public organizations is a bureaucracy that mandates who can be hired and regulates the conduct of uh, the civil service. Um, and specifically also regulates the conduct of employees that work in public enterprises. In other words, there is a degree of rigidity. That rigidity also means that at times it might be difficult to fire incompetent workers. And hence, obviously, this interferes with incentives. Furthermore, it is also difficult for governments to compete with private enterprises because of these rigidities and because also of funding. People in the private sector tend to earn more. So as a result, the public sector is unable to often attract the best and the brightest, specifically to work in public enterprises. So hence, the result is that often there are certain people that are incompetent, but that remain within state-owned enterprises and they cannot be fired. And of course, this translates into subpar performance within these enterprises. Then what we also have is we have individual differences. So individuals that work within organizations, public enterprises specifically, have little incentives. In other words, unlike a private enterprise, they will not be paid more uh, if their performance is good. Furthermore, it is also difficult to fire them. So the question is, what are the incentives that bureaucrats then have? In other words, public employees. So what public employees begin doing is they start enjoying the power and prestige associated with being in charge of a large organization. An increasing bureaucracy is associated with greater expenditure, obviously bureaucracy costs. So if you have bureaucrats, public employees attempting to increase the sphere of control, what happens is they increase the size of bureaucracy and they spend more funds on increasing that size of bureaucracy. So essentially, let's say that you have a bureaucracy and it is providing some kind of services and those services are associated with a specific price. And that is what we see in panel A. So what panel A shows is a demand curve for a bureaucrat service. So as the price of the service declines, the quantity of services demanded increases. So you are paying a price for a service that is rendered by a bureaucracy. In other words, a public servant, let's say. And the amount of profit that or the amount of expenditure that is undertaken is the price maximized by the quantity at each level. In other words, this rectangle here gives us the amount of expenditure that is paid to bureaucrats for a specific service. Now, what is it the bureaucrat, a bureaucrat will do? Well, what a bureaucrat will do is a bureaucrat will attempt to maximize the amount of total expenditure on the services, level of services are provided. So hence, if you see a graph here, what happens is that as we increase the level of the price, what happens is that total expenditure increases. So this is maximizing a bureaucracy's size. And what will happen is that the price for the services rendered will be increased by bureaucrats right up until a point that total expenditure is maximized. And that is this point that is reflected on this diagram in panel A. The point is that services could potentially cost less or less could be spent on bureaucratic services, the services provided by public service enterprises. However, because there is no competition, what happens is that public enterprises, which are run by bureaucrats, maximize total expenditures. So they charge a higher price in order to maximize uh, their total expenditures. And hence, what they are doing is they are maximizing bureaucracy's size. So bureaucracy could be less costly if there was competition. And that is linked to individual differences that arise as a result of a lack of incentives within public enterprises. And that is why bureaucrats attempt to maximize bureaucracy size. So 
expenditure is higher on these services, then would be ideal. So that is a source of inefficiency. Also, what we need to talk about is the principal agent problem. And the principal agent problem arises when the principal is not being effectively represented by the agent. And the agent is serving in the interests of the principal. Within the context of public enterprises and the public service, the agents are the bureaucrats. They are meant to serve in the, the interests of the public. In other words, us, the people. However, this the problem. A problem might arise that uh, the interests of the agent and the principal are not always aligned. In other words, bureaucrats' interests deviate from that of the public. And why does this happen? Well, what is required are incentive structures. And what incentive structures do is they represent the most effective ways of aligning incentives and aligning interests. So the idea is that the agent does in fact act in the best interests of the principal. And that can be achieved by providing some kind of incentive. In other words, by providing rewards for good performance, such as uh, bonuses, and punishing bad performance, such as being fired. And what happens is that in the public service, these uh, principal agent problems are rather formidable for a number of reasons. And the reason why is because there are no punishments for bad performance and there are few if any incentives for good performance in other words there is not much to incentivize the alignment of interests between the principal and the agent furthermore what also happens is that bureaucracies are subject to risk aversion in other words bureaucrats fear making mistakes in order to absolve themselves from responsibility for mistakes what happens is that bureaucracy creates procedures, bureaucratic procedures that ensure that all actions by bureaucrats are reviewed by the actions by, by others in the bureaucracy. And what this does is it gives rise to the nature of bureaucracies. Everything must pass through the appropriate channels. And as you can imagine, these appropriate channels might be rather long. So it is difficult to get anything done. It is difficult to ensure efficiency. So not only do we have the principal agent problem, we also have large bureaucracies with many processes that must be followed in order to implement some kind of measure or an action. So what we have in bureaucracies is the emphasis on procedural compliance rather than the quality of the results that arises. So both the principal agent problem and bureaucratic procedures are what contributes to government failure and inefficiency in the public sector. Now let's proceed to the second part of this lecture. This is the part that deals with public choice. And the corresponding chapter is chapter nine. So now what we face is a slightly different problem when allocating resources within the public sphere. Within a private market, what happens is that there is a very effective uh, signaling mechanism, and that is the price. And uh, prices ensure the efficient resource allocation. So what happens is that if individuals consumer, individual consumers who constitute the market demand a specific type of good and there's a shortage of that good, what happens is that the price goes up. If the price goes up, resources are shifted into the production of that good. So it is easy to see from the perspective of a private market and easy to determine where resources should be allocated because we have this price mechanism. So what prices do is they convey information effectively from consumers to producers concerning the value they attach to different commodities and also from producers to consumers uh, concerning the costs of production and the scarcity of these commodities. And then equilibrium in the private market is determined at the intersection of the demand and the supply curve. So that is the equilibrium quantity and that corresponds to an equilibrium price. And that is the price that clears the market. It ensures that the quantity supplied is equal to the quantity demanded. So let's say now suddenly what happens is that we have the demand for commodities increasing. So the demand curve shifts upwards. What is the result of that? Well, the price rises and hence this induces firms to produce more. So that is how within the supply and demand framework, prices convey information about a change in individual tastes and preferences.
So in a competitive economy, what happens is that because of the price mechanism, which is a signal mechanism, what we achieve is an efficient resource allocation. This is not as simple when we deal with the public sector. Specifically, decisions about resource allocations in the public sector are made in a different manner. So the question that public servants face is, how do we allocate resources? And specifically, we don't really see that price mechanism. So that price mechanism doesn't work as well in order to signal what should be produced and how much of it as it does in private markets. And this is complicated by the presence of a political process. So think about it this way. So we have individuals who vote for representatives, for example, members of parliament, uh, and these representatives then vote for a public budget. And that public budget is then spent on providing goods and services to the population. In other words, the money itself is spent by a variety of administrative agencies that carry out political decisions. However, there is a major difference between how an individual decides to spend his or her own money and how Parliament decides to spend public's money. So in deciding to vote, members of Parliament face two problems. Congress, as this is an American textbook, but analogous to that is Parliament. That is why I'm saying Parliament. So first of all, what they must determine is what do the constituents want? This is not as simple anymore because you don't have that price mechanism operating in the same way. Second of all, because views are likely to differ, they must decide how much weight to assign to various positions. In other words, there are various constituencies within the general voting public. And what public uh, representatives, representatives must do now is to decide how much goods must be produced. And that is related to what is being demanded by those constituencies. So, for example, some constituencies might want that more money is spent on policing. On the other hand, some might want that more is spent on schooling. So what we have is a problem of preference revelation because of those two factors. So in other words, there is no effective way that individuals can express their views about the desirability of one public good versus the other. So yes, they can vote for public officials and public officials promise to spend more money on one service relative to another. For example, more money on policing relative to, let's say, schooling. But even then, that is still limited information about what voters truly want. So what politicians have done is turn to polls to a certain voters' preferences. So what is it that the voters want? Uh, and what these polls do is they guide public preference. So for example, polls might show that uh, the public wants a reduction in the deficit. But the problem is that there's no consistent picture that emerges concerning trade-offs. So some polls might suggest that voters would be willing to pay higher taxes, whereas other polls will show that um, voters will be willing to accept expenditure cuts in order to reduce the deficit. Even then, this is not a perfect mechanism. It is not a mechanism such as the price that determines the exact quantity that is produced. Furthermore, because no money is directly involved in purchasing these goods, public goods, or uh, carrying out a government program, it is difficult to gauge trade-offs. What is it that individual consumers are willing to give up? This is something that's difficult to observe if we are talking about public preference. Furthermore, the problem that we also face is that individual knows that their preference, individual preference, have, will have a negligible effect on the amount of a specific public good is, that is supplied. So hence, there is no incentive to be truthful about their preferences. And this leads to a conclusion of this lecture, and we'll continue the discussion in the next lecture.